I, I kept saying, somebody should get this out there to the mainstream. Somebody should let the, let people know that this is there. And then finally I realized that, that somebody was me and I decided to do it. Welcome to the Greener Grass podcast from Bluebird Botanicals. I'm your host, Lex Pelger. Lakshmi Narayan is a web designer and advocate who has thrown herself into a passion project. She's now developing a documentary about Ibogaine as a tool against opioid addiction. She wants to shine a light on this ancient plant medicine that involves a challenging psychedelic journey with a long tradition of human use. She explains what it's like for someone struggling with addiction to embark on such a radical transformation. I'll talk to Lakshmi about the filmmaking process, her own experience with the iboga plant, and why she thinks this message is so important today. Also, we'll include a link to her fundraiser to help complete this important project, and the trailer to show how much they've already captured. We encourage everyone to support this important project. This show is brought to you by Bluebird Botanicals, to spread education about cannabis and other things on the greener side of life. Bluebird CBD oil comes from farms in southern Colorado and is grown using only water, soil, and sunlight. Go to bluebirdbotanicals.com for more info. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with Lakshmi, who is working on a really important project about iboga. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Lex. Thanks for having me. How do you describe iboga to people who have never heard about it? Iboga is a root bark that can interrupt opioid addiction in one treatment. That, to me, is its most important feature during an addiction epidemic, that it can do that. Um, iboga by itself is not a, a cure-all for addiction, but it could literally end the overdose deaths that are happening by people who have no way out of that addiction cycle. Uh, the second quality that it has is that it, 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 there's not a lot of medical research on this, but it's been known to restore brain function and to, and to people have reported anecdotally that uh, they've done rehab and they've come out of rehab detoxed, but not functional. But an Ibog Ibogaine trip brings you back to functionality. It brings you back to wholeness. So you come out of it and you're reset and you can actually, you actually have a chance to get over your addiction and reclaim your life. It's often referred to as the grandfather of, of entheogens because it's such a long, physically arduous and mentally arduous journey. Um, what's it like for people who are very nervous about this, something that's maybe the next level from ayahuasca even? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, experts in the Ibogaine field who've been doing this for, for years say from their own experience is that Ibogaine by itself is, is not going to do it. And in order to approach that Ibogaine journey properly, you need pre-care and you need aftercare. So, uh, you know, pre-care, part of pre-care is uh, really preparation for this very, very... Um, deep, I should say, deep journey into your own psychology, your own pathology, your own spirituality, you know, all of those dimensions. So um, I would say for someone who was nervous about it, that, that they should enroll in a pre-care program and uh, be guided. And that kind of guidance would really help them have the right uh, expectations, the right set setting and intention towards their journey. One thing that, that doesn't seem to get mentioned enough is you do need uh, very good practitioners because this can be very hard on a heart and that there should be somebody there who can operate paddles in case someone is the one, one time out of 500 where this might stop their heart. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There is a cardiac risk. You know, it's, it, Ibog Ibogaine is not for is not to be taken lightly. It's powerful medicine. It's, it has no recreational use whatsoever. It should be taken with medical supervision. Uh, even before you actually do an Ibogaine trip, the responsible clinics will do EKGs and blood tests, a whole panel of tests, and make sure that your cardiac health is good enough to undertake the journey. 
and enduring you should you need to have um, monitoring so yes absolutely not to be taken lightly um, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the the pre-Western history with iboga, where it came from and how it was used there. Um, so iboga has been used um, for hundreds, if not thousands of years um, in Central Africa, first by the Pygmies, and then I believe the Pygmies gave it to the Gwiti tribe in Gabon. And they have used it uh, ceremonially as a rite of passage for their young for their young adults. Uh, when the missionaries came to that area in the 18th century, they demonized it and uh, they Christianized the area, but the ceremony still went on because it was part of their culture. In the 60s, uh, Ibogaine got lumped in with uh, all the other psychedelic medicines and uh, schedule became a scheduled substance in the United States. And it still is a, a gray area in many parts of the world. So how did Iboga come to the West then, especially in the, the 60s and 70s? And now I'm still researching this, so I don't know a whole lot about it, but Iboga was brought to the West by Howard Lotsoff. Although there are reports that Iboga was being used in 18th century Europe uh, to detox from heroin. And uh, it, it was kind of very underground, I believe. And so then it got mixed up with the the general prohibition and war on drugs of the 60s, despite not being a recreational and despite being something that could be helpful. Um, and so I was curious about your own personal journey with it. Um, after working with Crossroads, did you get a chance to uh, try this as well? Yeah, um, Martin Polanco offered offered a journey at his psychospiritual weekend program. And so I did do that. And um, it, it was profound for me, profoundly transformational on a psychological and physical level. So when they were doing the blood test right before the Ibogaine journey, they told me that it looked like I had high blood sugar and that I was probably diabetic. And my father had died of diabetic neuropathy. And so I was uh, shocked, but I wasn't surprised. So I went into the Ibogaine journey just having found out that I was diabetic. And my, my entire journey was a discourse or a expose into the roots of my disease and, and my father's disease and addiction. And the addiction was sugar in this case. And then when I came out of the journey, I... Um, had completely lost my addiction to sugar, but I didn't actually realize that that had happened until three years later, because all that happened was I came out in the three months after the Ibogaine trip, which is a window that's really important because the Ibogaine is still in your system and it's working in a certain way and you have a, a window of opportunity to work further to integrate things. And during that window, I was able to lose 30 pounds and I completely reversed diabetes too. So that made me a believer in Ibogaine. Wow. Did you know you were going to be working with the plant after that in terms of awareness and letting people know? Boy, that's really funny because, uh, no, I didn't really know it. I, I was, right from when I first encountered Ibogaine and started to learn about it, I, I kept saying, you know, somebody should somebody should get this out there to the mainstream. Somebody should let the, let people know that this is there. And then finally, I realized that that somebody was me, and I decided to do it. Um, I was having a psychic reading with this guy from Cape Town, and so because he was from Cape Town, I just asked him, "So, what's my relationship with Abigail?" And he said, "Well, the words that come are uh, liberation," and so the the documentary that. I'm making is being called the route to liberation. And so how did you um, start making this documentary and get involved with a project of this uh, size? I made a decision to stop doing web design and branding and to devote myself to making movies, which is a long-term dream I've had. And right after I made that decision, uh, these clients of mine, Iboga Recovery Center, they were going to Gabon to have a beauty ceremony and so I, I said to them that they should film it. It was a one-time thing. And so we ended up filming that. 
And then, and then I, as soon as I filmed that, I realized that I had all the resources. The peop, I know the people in this community. I, I, I know enough about it uh, to make a movie about it. So I, I decided to make a movie. And then I reached out to Eric Tierman, my co-producer, uh, who's a, a Academy Award nominated social documentarian. And in in the 80s, he made a film about the nuclear winter that was on Life was in Life magazine and became viral in those days. And it was the, uh, I guess it was like the the siren song for the Green Party in Europe, and it did really well. And and so I thought he was a good person to collaborate with. And luckily for me, he said yes. And so we're off and running. And we made a great little trailer video and uh, you know it's such a vital subject that i don't see how people couldn't support it and just to let everyone know uh, there's currently an indiegogo campaign up to support this project and so we'll be sharing that in the episode notes and one of the things that really impressed me about the uh trailer you already put together is the the names of the people involved people like uh, ken alper and gabor mate who are absolutely the, some of the biggest figures in this field, but also people like my uh, buddy Kevin, who is a, a good speaker on this as well. And it seems like you're getting the top experts as well as getting to talk to people who are actually have had the experience and had it deeply affect their lives. Yeah, absolutely, Lex. I think we need uh, we need accounts from experts and experiencers of, of, of Ibogaine so that we can bust some of the myths about what a psychedelic journey is and and what to expect. I think uh, I think we need to recontextualize that for a more mainstream audience. You know, people in the Bible Belt. People, uh, there's a lot of people who are you know very conservative, but that's where the addiction epidemic is strongest in some of those areas. And how has it been talking to people outside this community and letting them know about this, you know, rather surreal idea of this African root bark really having such a profound effect on people's uh, uh, relationship to addiction? We've just started, so I don't have very much to report on that. Um, I, I do. I have spoken to a couple of mothers in the Midwest whose sons have been going through uh, ibogaine. And they're very, very grateful for it because they see the, the see, they see the change in their children. They see the life come back in their eyes. They they know that it's it's broken through the trance of heroin addiction or you know or whatever it is it they're they're caught in. So uh, I think when people understand what this can do and understand that there are responsible ways to address this they'll change their minds, as Michael Pollan says in his new book. And that's one of the things that I think is really intriguing about what you're doing is that it's not only a documentary, but it's a four-part campaign, as well as making the movie Ibogo Route to Liberation. You're also doing a phone petition app um, and a social media outreach, and then very interestingly, an Ibogo directory of providers as well. And how did you come up with such a, uh, such a system? Well, I created Awake.net. I've, I've, I've created it over the last four years as a um, collective wisdom blog. And so it's already set up to do all this. But I didn't really have a strong subject uh, to coalesce that structure around. And then Iboga came around and it, the, the structure was already in place, which is really miraculous. And so I was able to implement that directory very quickly. I didn't I did it all myself. I didn't ask for permission. I didn't create committees. I just did it because all I did was get the, you know, links and the phone numbers of the direct of the people. So the directory is just a starting point. It's a couple dozen places that I have heard uh, are reputable. Uh, I just want to emphasize that anyone who's going through that directory and talking to any to people and should do their own research and be really thorough about it. And what's it been like um, talking to all of these different providers? Because it can be a rather fractured field because of the illegality, because of having to work out of the country, um, and and people having so many different ideas about how to hold space for Iboga. 
Yeah, so the I Will the Save social media campaign, um, let me talk a little bit more about that because the question you really asked was about how all of that came together. So uh, so I started out with this documentary and, and then um, I had this idea for the app, Reschedule, Reschedule Psychedelics, but Reschedule Ibogaine is, is what it ended up becoming. And I realized that the app itself is, a, is like a media tool for spreading the word. And so it, it just makes sense to create the app uh, because the film itself, the, the subject has social, political, psychological, and spiritual implications. It, is a, it just does. And so we're hoping to, to really show the big picture about all of those things in the movie. And the follow-up to somebody watching that movie would be to go sign the app and join the movement. But all of that is going to take, a, at the very best, a year and a half, more likely two years or, or more, because movies take a long time. And so we're going to do a social media campaign. And so we created the directory so that right now people can go and find a clinic. And the social media campaign is going to be in November. and it's. Um, an intensive iboga education. And who are you uh, most excited to talk to around the country about this and to feature them in the film? What I'm excited about is is actually not to talk to people, but to follow. Our goal is to show how healing happens during an entheogenic experience like this. And so our goal is to follow three or four addicts through their experience at different clinics around the world and through the through their stories we will illuminate how addiction gets healed and we definitely want to focus on the integration process too because that's really important and so what advice would you have for people listening who have friends or loved ones or are themselves dealing with addiction and are curious about what you're talking about and want to learn more and perhaps participate? Well, the best thing they could do is to go on to awake.net and read some of those articles and sign up for our 30 day iboga intensive because they're going to get an education from experts in the ibogaine industry. These articles are going to be co-authored by different people like, um, Ken Alper and Gabor Mate and, um, Martin Polanco and Deanne Adamson and uh, uh, Patrick Krupa. M- many different people are going to contribute to this. I haven't named all, all the people who might end up being on there, just, just so you know. Um, but so it's going to be the voice of the Ibogain community, the, the voice of Ibogain expertise, the collective voice. How do you feel about the national feeling that's possible with iboga considering the opioid epidemic. Do you think this is a time where this really could lead to a serious shift? Yeah, I think that we're we're in a time where the opioid epidemic has become so bad with 197 people and growing dying a day that a, a real solution might find an audience. Um, I feel that people are kind of numb numb to n- the numbers, you know, because opioid addiction has an opium addiction has been around for such a long time and we're really used to that but really think about what would it be like if we didn't have so many homeless people we didn't who are who are homeless because they're addicted we didn't have crime related to that we didn't have the broken families the grieving mothers just think about what would it be like if we had 70,000 less people dead a year our communities are going to be different. It will it would change our world. And so I feel like really I'm reaching out to the psychedelic community to join me in this movement and, and create the push that would bring this to the mainstream and to bring it to the mainstream in a credible, intelligent, heart, heartfelt way. Uh, it's excellent work, and I really appreciate you being out there uh, spreading the story. Um, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we let you go or things that you're excited about in the near uh, term with the project? Well, I'm just excited about about reaching out to people and communicating about it right now. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on to share, and we'll have all of the links to the Indiegogo campaign and to awake.net in the episode notes. So, uh, Lakshmi, thank you so much for your work and for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks a lot, Lex. Greener Grass is a Bluebird Botanicals podcast. Their CBD oil supports a healthy body and a strong endocannabinoid system. They've got friendly customer service who can answer any of your questions, and the number is right there at the top of their webpage. But, per the FDA, they won't be able to make any medical claims for these nutritional supplements. That's also the reason you'll hear little about CBD on this show. There's no need for us to add more evidence about CBD when a simple Google search will give you more than you can read in a month of Sundays. So this show covers the cannabis world and more with editorial freedom from Bluebird Botanicals. Thanks for joining the Greener Grass podcast. As always, our audio alchemist is Matt Payne. The Gypsy Jazz theme music comes from Brett Van Donsel. Our beautiful bird sounds are courtesy of Lang Elliott. And I'm your host, Lex Pelger, wishing you a bright green day. <laughs>